Well, welcome to All Saints Lutheran Church. This is part two of the Augsburg Confessions with Vicar John, who is in the MDivX program up at Luther Seminary. We are delighted to join him for a part of his classroom uh, work, which is memorizing the Augsburg Confessions and then telling us what they mean. And then colorful commentary will follow. I am here also with Pastor Tanner, and my name is Jules. I'm one of the pastors here at All Saints. So, Vicar John, carry away. All right. Good morning. Well, maybe not good morning. Um, we are on part two of uh, this three-part series talking about the articles in the, um, the 28 articles in the Augsburg Confession. Today, we're going to talk about... Um, Articles 11 through 20. Um, the next 10 on the list, uh, the first series that, or the first session, we covered uh, 1 through 10. So here we go, 11 through 20. And the articles that we're going to cover are concerning confession and then repentance, the use of sacraments, uh, church government, uh, church regulations, public order, and secular government. And then concerning Christ's return, uh, free will, uh, cause of sin, and then the last one, faith and good works. So those are the 10 that we're going to cover today. Um, and uh, we'll get going right away on concerning confession. So this was, there's two articles on confession, um, of confession, article 11 and article 25. This is the first one is found. Uh, in this main section, and it's very short. Uh, it's in response to uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic theologian John Eck, uh, who was um, accusing the Lutheran reformers of all sorts of untrue charges um, as they were trying to bring through some of these changes. And one of these charges was that the Lutherans sought to abolish private confession and absolution entirely. So uh, despite the statement uh, in the article here, it's so the practice of absolution or absolving or releasing uh, people from sin, this personal forgiveness or confession, um, basically the Lutherans are, um, uh, the theologian John Eck is basically saying that they, the Lutherans want to abolish this. So this article was in, in def, uh, to defend their stance that they wanted to set this record straight that um, they did still believe that private confession, personal confession uh, was extremely important still um, in, um, in their doctrine. What they didn't believe though, however, was a confession of the enumeration of all sins. So basically stating all of your sins one by one, uh, trying to remember them all and um, they said that that was not necessary and um, they were against that. But as far as personal and private confession, um, they were absolutely for personal and private confession. However, despite that statement here in the article, uh, much of private confession, I would say, in the Lutheran Church has gone down. Um, I don't think you see much of it. I think you see much more uh, public confession of sins. Um, but um, so, yeah, that's the first article that we're talking about today. So. Mm -hmm. Concerning confession. It was a lovely exposition of it. I have a um, colorful commentary. Uh, Tanner, you want to go first? No, no, no. Go for it. Do your colorful commentary. Oh, I've, yeah. So I had a, a, a colleague of mine call me up and ask if they could come down and, and do a private confession. And I'd never done one before, so, but I've heard of them and I have seen enough TV shows with the priest behind the veil and all that. <laughs> so I'm like, sure, come on down. So they get, I, I take them into the sanctuary, light up some candles, kneel at the rail, and um, I'm standing opposite of them and they start sharing like what they wanted to make confession about. And <laughs> I'm like, that's not a sin. <laughs> come up with another one i'm like that's not a sin either what <laughs> ended up being like like everything that they needed to confess none of them were none of them were sins they were just like it was just like a, a lament 
Like, I wish they could have done this other thing better than I did, you know? But it's like, so I'm like, you're absolved. You know, <laughs> I wanted to like flip into a Monty Python role there and just whack him on the head with the Holy Bible or something. But I refrain. That was a very good explanation. That's good. There's, there's my colorful comment. Yeah. And we still do. I mean, I think, John, I think you're right that in terms of individual confession versus corporate confession, we've definitely, we definitely lean significantly heavier on corporate, public, communal confession. But I mean, to this day, we still have a service of individual confession and forgiveness in our hymnal, right? That you could sit down and use either on your own or with a pastor or with a friend or a family member and, and walk right on through that. Uh, step by step like it's still definitely a big part of um, our tradition but the enumerating even even in this service there's no uh, enumeration of the very specific individual sins uh, because as the commentary continues in article 25 like Luther and others make it very clear that there's far too many of those things <laughs> and uh, you uh, should probably just go for a, more of a blanket statement if you want to get this covered. <laughs> Which I think is a really delightful way to look at it. Like Luther's idea was we're all really just uh, too terrible of a group of sinners in general that there's no way that you could really have time to confess it all. So um, maybe just 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 go for go for a, a big one and just hand, handle it there. Which he learned from personal experience, of course, in the monastery, as he wasted his life away in a confessional booth, until his confessor came to him and said what Pastor Jules said, mm, maybe, you, uh, maybe you need to not focus on this quite so much. <laughs> this seems like, uh, seems like you could better use your time. Go nail something to the door of some church. That'd be better. Uh, yes. Okay, are we ready for uh, 12? Keep on trucking. Concerning repentance. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so this really does bring us to the very issue, the core of what provoked the crisis uh, that resulted in the Reformation, um, the, the Roman Catholic sacrament of pen, penance. Uh, Rome taught that the, although baptism negated the original sin and removed all sins committed before, a person is baptized, any sin that's um, committed after baptism, for those sins, uh, they established the sacrament of penance. Um, the, while absolution removed the guilt of sin and eternal punishment, satisfactions were still necessary uh, to remove that temporal uh, penalty of sin. Um, and then um, so the, the granting of kind of an indulgement, indulgence. So, um, that really, this is the core of, of really what, um, why the Reformation happened to begin with. So true re the Reformers say that true repentance is nothing more than to have contrition and sorrow and believe that the gospel and the absolution of sins is forgiven is, is through grace, through Christ alone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that really is essentially what this article is about. Um, Finally, in the last part of this article, they reject the teaching of the Anabaptists at the time that said that um, that if you were once justified, you could lose that um, based on what you have done or what you could do in the future. Uh, they reject that notion. Um, but again, it's all true forgiveness is through grace, obtained through Christ alone. No other works. So. Comments. I don't have any more comments. That, that was great. That's the good stuff right uh, there. Maybe just one piece of clarification for those who might not be familiar with the word of indulgence, because again, we have this ecclesiastical kind of speak, um, and we don't actually use that word very often. So give us just a, a snapshot of, of what that means from the perspective of the Oxford Confessions, but also this particular article, because it, that was the tipping point, right? Right. Well, I think the indulgences um, were, uh, it was a 
practice that was established and it was actually a pretty corrupt uh, established practice where people could purchase um, indulgences and the more they purchased that basically if you purchased an indulgence and gave money to the church for uh, yourself or actually for a loved one that actually had passed away and um, wasn't quite hadn't quite made it to heaven they were in purgatory this halfway point between um, not quite into heaven you could purchase these indulgences that would actually um, boost them up into heaven or or forgive them totally of, of some sins that they had um, had committed and yet had not been fully fully um, forgiven for so mm -hmm. another uh, an example of a human act um, to help with the forgiveness or a human you know it, it imparted some sort of human work to get us to fully forgiven or to to get us fully into heaven. So that's what the indulgences were. Um, yeah. That's it, right there, yeah. So Luther, Luther took issue with them hmm. in general. To be fair, the majority of the Roman Catholic Church over the past 500 years has also taken issue with them. So, yeah. you know, yeah. come a long ways in that partnership. But. Yeah. So. Cool. All right. 13 is uh, concerning the holy sacraments. So the use of the holy sacraments um, that the reformers taught that were not only outward signs um, mm -hmm. that people could recognize that people that the, that people uh, taking part in the sacraments were Christians outwardly, but also inwardly that not only is it a sign outwardly, but an inwardly sign to awaken um, and strengthen faith. So the sacraments are used um, to uh, strengthen our faith in God. Um, that's in direct contrast to um, some of the other uh, teaching at the time. Zwigli was a reformer in uh, Switzerland, uh, the Reformed Church. Him and uh, his uh, his um, followers uh, believed that sacraments were merely just signs um, that people. Um, define themselves as Christians, but they spoke adamantly against that the sacraments had any power to create or strengthen um, faith. So uh, the reformers, uh, basically, we believe in two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's um, Supper. Um, and it is God's working through these earthly objects um, that is strengthening our faith and awakening um, ourselves to a, a deeper presence with God. So. Concerning the use of sacraments, Article Thirteen. Well done, and in our in our new member classes, and in our confirmation classes, and our all of our foundational faith classes, we talk about the sacraments having three distinct components to them, as just an addition to your commentary, and um, <clears throat> has to have an earthly element which is wheat, wine, water. It is uh, commanded by God, go therefore, or do this in remembrance. And there's no, nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing that we can do to deserve it. It's freely given grace, grace, grace. Mm -hmm. There is your new member class in a nutshell. Thank you <laughs> for participating. All right. This is also one of the articles, I think, that, I just think that it's funny. You, there are a couple of articles here where later editions of it add italics to, to like, force home. And so in, like, mid-1500s, they started adding italics to these things to, like, say, and by the way, we really mean this and do not like these people that disagree with us. Right. And whenever he's talking about condemning the Anabaptists and Zwingli's people and things like that, he adds italics now, which is just hilarious to me. So. Right. Who are the Novatians? Um, he was a, a leader from Rome, a schism group, um, and denied the idea of restoration. Um, so basically, like, uh, if you were baptized and received forgiveness, um, uh, and then you messed up again, you couldn't be restored to grace. Like, that's 
Absolutely. Like there, there was this idea of like, you need to seek perfection because if you don't, it's a lot of hell. And uh, so they didn't like him. I don't like him. He, he, made, he made a distinction between like so-so sins and grave sins. Um, oh, yeah. And the... Luther also didn't like that. So right. sin is sin is sin. So That's important for people to recognize too, because I think there's a bandwidth of people out there that are omission, commission, you know, they, they want to categorize the sin stuff. But I, I'm ready to go on to Article 14. If... Okay. Concerning church government. Uh, no one should preach, teach, or administer the sacraments without a proper call. And they believe that the public ministry is not a human invention, has been established by God for the building up of God's church on earth. At the same time, the divine call comes through a group of believers. It's a call uh, through a congregation. So it's both and. Mm -hmm. um, one that may not just assume for himself a position of a pastor, but really has to have that call come through um, the um, congregation. Absolutely. And uh, every Christian, by virtue of faith in Christ, has a call. Um, it's just, they, they just differ. So essentially that's what this is about. This, um, And it's, I mean, one of the things that we have uh, held on to very strongly in, in terms of our ordination practices, right? Like, yes, every Christian has a call and a vocation, but the call to public ministry is very specific uh, in our tradition in that uh, you can go through school and get your MDiv and go through candidacy and do all the things for years and years and years and do the process. But until you get a call from a congregation saying, hey, you can be our pastor, you don't get ordained, which is, is very different in our tradition compared to many other traditions where you get ordained and then you go and find a church. Mm -hmm. um, we, we say very specifically that a group of believers has to look at you and say, we believe that God is calling you to be our pastor and then you get ordained. Pull it right out of Article 14. <laughs> All right. Uh, good. Our, oh, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm good. I, okay. I don't know what happened there. I just, the yeah, internet no just shut down for a minute and then it popped back up again. So my apologies. Uh, it's okay. We lost you for a second. Uh, the Article 15 is concerning church regulations. And I think... A more uh, understandable title might be the customs, church customs and traditions um, that get uh, established uh, over time. Um, more and more customs uh, that uh, we do um, basically for, um, uh, to actually help us in our faith, to bring us closer to God, um, such as celebrations and festivals, um, uh, monastic vows are listed, um, type of foods we can eat. Um, but it was important for the reformers to say that while these regulations or these customs and traditions are important to grow our faith, they do not earn uh, favor uh, towards God. They absolutely do not uh, bring us any cl um, uh, closer to salvation with God. Salvation of God is through grace alone. Uh, through uh, through um, uh, through God, there's nothing that we can do. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And when they do, when they do get in the way, then we should set them aside. Right, like that's the idea here, you know. So and bury them, kick them into a hole. Yes, yeah. it's the reason that occasionally we walk away from the Revised Common Lectionary and do Christmas in July instead. <laughs> It's efficacious. <laughs> I actually, I didn't, I was unsure of that to begin with, but I really, that was really good. So. All right, next one, 16? 16. Concerning public order and secular government. Um, this was... Um, really important uh, article in the eyes of the emperor. 
uh, because um, the, again, um, this John Eck, this uh, Roman theologian, was kind of stirring up some, some trouble again, uh, a little bit. The, um, the bloody peasants revolt had uh, just had taken place um, and uh, there was thousands, thousands killed by this revolt. And Luther was, was seen uh, as for many that he was um, involved or he knew some of the people involved. Um, so this was this article was was written to make sure that they um, they acknowledged that all political authority, government, and good order uh, was instituted by God, and that Christians uh, without sin can be involved in this political authority. Um, they can be a judge. They can pass sentences. They can administer justice. Um, they can uh, punish. Uh, uh, Evil doers, I think that was what they called. They can serve as soldiers, take oaths. Um, so this was really uh, basically that there is good in an orderly government and laws. So this one's fun. This one's interesting because I like we have to recognize that like. Yes, we're Lutherans, and yes, we hold up Lutheran. We, you know, we've got a statue in front of our seminaries and all that. But like, he messed up sometimes. And th there are some of these moments in history where he, due to the uh, socio-political nature of his life and ministry, and the threats on him and his colleagues, like he had to side with the empire, whoever the empire was. Um in order to survive um and this that's a problem <laughs> i mean like we see that now right i mean this is a this is a, a time where christians were not being persecuted christians were in the majority everybody literally everybody was a christian in these places because you had to be because if your leader was a christian you had to be a christian right and so i don't know it was this is this is one of those moments where I think that we can focus we can focus really well on this idea that he's saying, contrary to some of the other reformers at the time, like it is okay for Christians to be involved in government and should be. You should be involved in the secular civic affairs of the world around you. The the two kingdoms idea. Like you need to go and be involved. You should go and be an election judge. You should go and run for office. You should do all of these things. Um, I, but I hate it when this article is propped up and, and used to say, regardless of who's in charge and what they're doing, that is obviously ordained by God. And there's a couple of Bible verses that get chucked in there to use that as well. And that's just like clearly not reality. Like it's clearly not. Because the people who were in charge when Luther started all of this, he revolted against. And then people who came in to be in charge who liked him, and then he didn't revolt against them, right? Like, oddly enough, Luther is much like the rest of humanity. <laughs> and, you know, has, has the fallacies and failures that we all do. And so I think that it is important that we don't prop this one up as a, uh, a, a sweeping idea that we should just listen to whoever's in charge because, of course, God put them there. Right. Well, and did you just sign up to be an election judge? You bet I did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's part of that civic. We are called as, as um, Christian public leaders. And that will make an effect on government. And to be connected with that and to um, speak up for those who have no voice is absolutely a part of our, our role. Um, what came to mind is, as you were talking, uh, Tanner, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think about how he, his Christian public leadership, even to the end, you know, just like took, took that, that grace and just, just kept, kept at it. If any of you have not done any research around Dietrich Bonhoeffer or read his book, Life Together, uh, I highly recommend that you just go ahead and get it on your Kindle and sit at the end of your dock and read it because it's one of those books that will, um, well, well, 
transformed how I understood grace in a, in a way that no other book had up to that point. And it's small. I mean, you can yeah. crank it out in like an afternoon. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> All right. Article 17 mm -hmm. concerning Christ's return to judgment. Again, uh, uh, they put in this article and uh, essentially the words from the, the Apostles' Creed, Christ will return on the last day to judge the living and the dead, um, that to give eternal life, eternal joy to those who believe, but to condemn the ungodly um, to hell. And this was in um, defense of some of the teaching at the time that uh, there were some that said that hell does not exist or that those that do go to hell will only suffer for a short time. Uh, there were others um, um, in a millennialism movement at the time uh, that said that there would be a thousand years um, uh, that, that Christ would come and establish an earthly kingdom for a thousand years at some point in the future. Um, taken, they took that from uh, a verse from Revelation. But this was, um, this was basically to establish that uh, what, the, what the reformers believe that Christ will come again. So I think we need to focus on that Christ will come again bit, not the damnation to hell. Mm -hmm. Which is what we do here and in the ELCA. And it reminded me of the scripture passage that I got to preach on with the wheat and the tares, and it's, it's the angels that are going to do the work upon that return. It's not our job to condemn somebody to hell and damnation. Right. Yes. Right. As it turns out, it's so weird. Shockingly enough. Um, my color, my color commentary on this particular section, you can cut out later if you want, because my color commentary is on sentence five about where he brings in the Jewish stuff, um, oh. the Jewish yeah. teachings. Yeah. Um, and I like, it is fascinating to me that we are back. I mean, I don't think it ever really left, but we were back to that sort of language existing, particularly in certain aspects of American Christian culture, um, where there is this idea amongst American, some American Christian groups that we have to support Israel and a Jewish kingdom in order to uh, bring about um, a, this thousand years of peace, right? That if this <laughs> this uh idea of of jewish authority very specific religious um kingdom authority zionism sort of thing has to exist um and once that happens they will help annihilate all of the bad people and then jesus will rule and so they have they have they encouraged some of these these things over the past 60 years um to, to to push this weird weird strange mantra that like existed in luther's day like and he's he was writing against at that point in time and saying like this is a weird thing that we shouldn't be a part of like we don't we don't need to create this thousand year kingdom that's not our gig god will do what god wants to do and that's not our gig and I don't know. I, I just thought that was really interesting reading through that this week. That, that was still like so much a part of, I don't know, this odd bit of culture. Right. Strange. There you go. All right. Next article. All right. 18 concerning free will. Uh, here the reformers are basically saying that human beings do have some measure of free will to live an honorable life. Um, however, uh, without grace and the work of the Holy Spirit, um, humans cannot 
become pleasing to God or believe in God uh, with the whole heart. So um, it's this intervention of God that is the absolutely necessary for us to be in union with God. Um, that that uh, scripture teaches that God has saved us, not because of anything um, in us, but through God's grace. Um, and that we cannot at all in any way contribute to our salvation in any way, shape, or form. So, but we were given the reason or given the ability, ability to reason and make rational choices. Article 18, free will. Make good choices. <laughs> All right. Next one? Yeah, let's do 19. Okay. The cause of sin. Here we go. Although God did create and uh, preserve nature, uh, God is not the cause of sin. Um, it is uh, the Lutheran um, reformers uh, really begin the article by declaring that God is not the cause of sin. Rather, the devil and our own sinful flesh is the cause of sin. God's will is, is in complete opposition to sin. And I would say that sin is really just the separation, uh, separation of God. So... Um, they said they wanted to just make sure that this in this article, I believe, was that um, sin does not come from God. Mm -hmm. It's a very short article. It here. You all can't see it, but it's like it's two three lines. That's yeah. it. So we can move on to 20 on that one. And okay. Significantly longer article. <laughs> it is significantly and this will, this will conclude, I think, this section, right? Yeah. So concerning faith and good works. Um, again, um, uh, the reformers are basically saying um, uh, they were accused that they were forbidding good works. Um, they were accused by the, uh, some in the Roman Catholic, some Roman Catholic theologians that in this reform, they were absolutely against good works. And I think what this article is, is a defense that the Lutheran reformers are saying, no, uh, we absolutely do not forbid good works, but we encourage them. But the good works are not to obtain, um, to obtain uh, grace or to obtain this closer march towards being closer to God. Um, the, that these good works are basically a result of or something that we can't help but do because of this faith and this grace through Christ, who is the mediator. Um, so that, um, yeah, so this is basically defending that um, faith and good works um, are all through, through God, not anything that we've done. So, Same by grace through faith. And uh, Article 3 of the Apostles' Creed, which is the compelling urge of the Holy Spirit, we cannot help but, as you said, John, that was spot on. Right on. Huge fan of good works. Huge fan of good works. Absolutely. Just, just not as a measure of salvation. Right. Yeah, and I think Luther had had an issue with like the book of James, because James encouraged good works, but he called it the book of straw because it seemed like it was an earning kind of deal. And I don't know, it, it's, not a, it's not a bad book. It just needs to, you always have to look at all of the books that, that, you know, don't just take out the Bible bullets and lock and load them, as I like to say. Any other comments from Pastor Tanner? No, that's good. All right, this wraps up our second session of the Augsburg Confessions with the wit and wisdom of the triune pastors in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, All Saints Lutheran Church. Have a great day, week, whatever. Peace out.